Coming up on DTNS, could NFTs help people circumvent Hollywood? What life is like with a chronological Facebook feed and how Apple is hurting advertisers. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, October 22nd, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Chris Ashley. <laughs> Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm Roger Shank. The show's pretty soon. We were just having a wide conversation on the uh, benefits and disadvantages of eating at Panera and Taco Bell. If you would like that expanded show, get Good Day Internet, become a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. That's where you can join our top patrons like Paul Thiessen, Ali Sanjabi, and Andrew Bradley. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. You may be under the impression that the U.S. bans sales of chips to Huawei. That's not exactly the case. The U.S. requires you to get a license if you want to sell chips and certain other kinds of products to Huawei. Thursday, U.S. House Representative Michael McCall of Texas got permission from the House Foreign Affairs Committee to release data from the U.S. Department of Commerce about how many licenses have been issued. From November 9th, 2020 through April 20th of this year, the U.S. granted 113 export licenses to sell about $61 billion worth of products to Huawei. So now you know. AMD's latest chipset driver resolves performance issues on Ryzen processors running Windows 11. Microsoft also began rolling out Windows Update to resolve increased L3 cache latency with Ryzen processors on the new OS. Yeah, a lot of people were waiting for that fix. Mm -hmm. Twitter publicly released the results of its internal investigation on what effect its algorithm has on amplifying political speech. This is when its algorithm adds it to your feed. Like, oh, we think you'd be interested in this. It analyzed tweets between April 1st and August 15th, 2020 from political parties and news outlets in Canada, France, Germany, Japan, Spain, the UK, and the US. It categorized the politics of a tweet based on public third party sources. You know, like <laughs> I'm a member of this party, that kind of thing. It didn't make it up itself or guess. They did not find that the algorithm amplified extreme content more than mainstream content, but they did find that the algorithm amplified right-leaning content a little more than left-leaning content. They did not determine whether this was a bias in the algorithm itself, might be, might not, or if the people creating right-leaning content are just better at using the system and getting amplified. Or if there's more engagement there. Yeah. Yep. So Apple introduced a new set of App Store guidelines with three key changes. One clarifies that developers are allowed to communicate with their customers about other payment methods. Mm -hmm. This is the result of the settlement of a class action set of a class action settlement with U.S. developers. So there you go. Apple said it will not take a commission on purchases made outside of its App Store system. Another change clarifies that developers can ask for name and email addresses as long as it's optional and won't prevent use of the app. They deleted a clause prohibiting using information obtained within the app to communicate about outside purchase options. The third change details the use for a new App Store feature called in-app events rolling out next week. Uh, that's it. That's the end. Everybody will just go buy that's outside it. the App Store now. It's all over. 3,000 app stores. Here we come. <laughs> uh, and the US NTSB updated its preliminary investigation report on the fatal crash in Spring, Texas of a Tesla that happened back on April 17th of this year. This is the one that indicated people might have left the driver's seat unoccupied it while the autopilot function was running, something that should have been prevented by Tesla's system. And the preliminary report has now been updated to indicate that the deformation of the steering wheel seems to have been partly caused by an impact. And that, along with data from the event data recorder, indicate the driver's and passenger seats were occupied and the seat belt buckled when the crash occurred. Thanks to James C. Smith for tipping us off on this update. The conclusions are still subject to change until a final report is published. But now you know the latest. All right, let's talk a little about Intel. Intel beat expectations on earnings per share last quarter, but fell short on total revenue. Net profit overall rose 60% on the quarter. So not bad, but devil's in the details. It's client computing group revenue, which includes PC chips, down 2% on the year. 
That was mostly caused by a 5% drop in notebook chip sales due to the ongoing chip shortage. And side note, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger said, we're in the worst of it now regarding the chip shortage. Every quarter next year will get incrementally better, but they're not going to have supply-demand balance until 2023. You, you, you hear some positive uh, spins on this and you hear some negative spins, but they're all pretty much saying either like, hey, it's going to keep getting better every quarter and we'll be in the clear in 2023. Or like Gelsinger, like, it's not going to get better till 2023. It might get a little incrementally better, but it's not all I be heard better. was buckle up. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. OK, that's the short term news uh, for Intel. Here's the long term. Uh, Gelsinger made some interesting comments in the earnings call. Intel is expanding its contract manufacturing, going from making only its own, only making its own chips, uh, to working with other companies to make their chips. They've tried this before, but they're really serious about it this time. Intel is in the middle of its transition under Gelsinger, or maybe not even in the middle. Uh, during the earnings call, Gelsinger said the contract manufacturing business will have little impact in the next couple of years. <laughs> Again, keep those seatbelts buckled. Uh, Gelsinger said that they will quote really deliver in years four and five and in the second half of the decade more significantly. So he's preparing people like, don't expect our foundries to just start pouring in the cash right away. We're doing this right and it's going to take time. Intel also wants to regain the leadership position in chip sales. That might happen a little sooner, but it's still going to cost you. Gelsinger plans to run the company's gross margins below current levels for the next two to three years. Another thing that investors don't like to hear, uh, he said it'll still be comfortably above 50%. But that's mostly down to capital spending of 25 to $28 billion next year. They're building new fabs. They're pouring money into research and development. In the end, Intel's biggest obstacle is TSMC, the leading foundry in the world. TSMC's advantage is long experience in meeting customer expectations. Intel has been its only foundry customer, only real foundry customer up till now. And Intel needs to gain trust. TMC doesn't make its own chips, so customers never have to worry that any intelligence will leak over into competing projects. To meet those challenges, Intel Foundry Services has been created as a standalone business reporting directly to Gelsinger, so it's kind of a startup. One more move that could help would be to acquire another Foundry business. There's been lots of rumors about Intel acquiring global foundries. That has never materialized, but never say never. But essentially, Intel... Gelsinger saying, Chris, we got a long way to go. He, he's trying to say we're going to make it, but it's not going to happen overnight. Have some patience, folks. Yeah, this is a very interesting thing because it, it's nice to see a business that was um, kind of shaky for the last couple of years. You know, everybody was counting them out uh, with Apple coming out with their chip to find a, an avenue that they could potentially pivot in. Uh, and, and go another direction and, and get healthy again. So that's what I'm reading out of this is, is like, look, if we can become the central point for making many other folks chips, you know, perhaps that that's the new way, much like when Microsoft did it, uh, pivoting to uh, the cloud, the Office 365. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good com comparison. There, there's a really good article from Ars Technica on on all of this, if you really want to get the lay of the land on this. There's also a, a pretty good uh, uh, description of this from The Verge and Protocol as well. We'll have links to all that in, in the show notes. But, you know, the short version is really it's hard to compete. Any It's hard for anybody to compete with TSMC right now. And if anybody can, it's Intel. Like, they, they have a lot of disadvantages in not having been in this game, but they also are the only ones big enough to maybe really make a go of it. So that'll be interesting to watch. Oh, yeah. So nobody yet knows what NFTs will be good for, but I think it's too short-sighted to dismiss, dismiss them out of hand just because there are a lot of, shall we say, less honest things being done with them. Mm -hmm. That would be like dismissing the internet in 1995 because there were scammers on Usenet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at the interesting example of how NFTs are being used. May or may not be the thing for NFTs, but it's interesting to consider Protocol has a profile with interview uh, with Erica Alexander, who played Maxine Shaw on the TV show Living Single back in the 90s. And I love that show, you know, with uh, Queen Latifah and, you know, the character Obi. Great show. I used to watch it all the time. So Alexander is working with an NFT platform called Curio to extend the universe of a sci-fi graphic novel called Concrete Park that she created with Tony Perrier. They created the novel in a response to a TV executive turning down the same story as a TV show premise because the executive believed 
black people don't see themselves in the future. Concrete Park started offering NFTs based on the graphic novel's characters in July. Those sold out quickly, so they created 7,000 more NFTs called bangers there that are avatars with unique traits and characteristics that aren't in the novel but fit in its world. Now begins the big challenge of creating a roadmap for the people participating in the community. Alexander talks of engaging fans one-on-one -on -one in the space. Where do you think this could go, Tom? I'm a big fan of people telling you, you can't do something because, you know, like, uh, you can't do this TV show because black people don't see themselves in the future, or you can't make money at a daily show about technology news. Uh, I'm a big fan of somebody saying, you know what, let me just go do this on my own. Right. Uh, and so I, I love this story. I love that that Alexander went and said, hey, there's a lot of technology out there. We could just leapfrog in front of the old system right. and show them what we can do. Uh, so I love that they're trying this. I, I love that they they not only made a graphic novel uh, of their, their premise to show that there was an appetite for the story, but then said, let's do more than that. Let's give people a, a, a chance to participate in right. the story. I'm still waiting and I'm still curious how they're going to proceed from here, right? We're still right. in the first two steps, which is we've created the characters and, and issued NFTs for those. We've created an expanded universe, so to speak, with these 7,000 bangers that people can get. And, and, and now yeah. it's the like, okay, cool. What are you going to do with that? Is it a game? Is it a, a social network? Is it a participatory story? There's all right. kinds of things they could do with it. Um, I don't know where it's going to go next, but I'm very curious to see if it goes somewhere. Like you said, this may not be the thing, you right. know, this may not be the thing that works, but there's so many different ways to approach using the non-fungible token, the thing that sure. says we can verify something unique on the internet. We can verify a unique digital file. There's so many cool things you can do with that. Yeah, so the, for me, the, and I agree with you wholeheartedly on, I love the fact that uh, her and her uh, teammate there just said, you know what, we're going to do this ourselves. Um, but what I'm hoping actually happens is more people attempt to take down the gatekeepers because it's so important for not just, uh, you know, uh, minorities in Hollywood and, and other uh, businesses. You, you got to break these gatekeepers down so that you can continue to do your own thing. You know, unfortunately, sometimes it goes left when you, you know, like a Uber or something like that, like, Let's take down, you know, the taxi companies and the monopolies they have, and mm. then they start being, you know, not the greatest company to their people. But I just like to see opportunities like this present itself and people take advantage of it and kick the door down. Yeah. That's why I don't like to dismiss the NFTs as just like, ah, it's a pyramid scheme. Like, it absolutely can be used as a pyramid scheme, and people sure. are doing that. I'm not trying to deny that. But there's something else, there's something else it's useful for, and somebody's right. going to hit on it. I'm yep. not saying it's this. I'm not saying it's not this. Maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Wired's Brian Barrett has an article up called I Used Facebook Without the Algorithm and You Can Too. Uh, Barrett focused on Frances Haugen's testimony to the U.S. Congress where she said, quote, I'm a strong proponent of chronological ranking, ordering by time with a little bit of spam demotion. We should have software that is human scaled where humans have conversations together, not computers facilitating who we get to hear from. Now, anyone can experience what that's like right now on your desktop Click most recent in the left-hand pane of Facebook. Mine was under a see more arrow. And on mobile, you have to tap the hamburger menu, those three lines, and then tap most recent. And then you get chronological. Facebook doesn't let you make that the default. You can bookmark facebook.com slash question mark SK equals H underscore CHR. We'll have that in the show notes. That would let you go to the chronological view every time you click it. But that doesn't help you use the app. Anyway, if you want to try it out, you can. And Barrett did. He noticed that when he viewed chronologically, the news feed reflected the percentage of people he followed versus brands. He follows a lot more brands. And in chronological order, he saw mostly brand posts because that's who he follows. The algorithm filled his news feed with posts from his friends. So it balanced it more. But even then, he noticed that his actual friends did not seem to post much compared to the brands. He said, at any given moment, the bulk of posts appearing organically in my feed were from the same half dozen people, none of whom I'm especially close with. However, in the algorithmic feed, he was seeing friends he was interested in, but sometimes the posts were four or five days old. Another thing he noticed was how news differed. In the chronological feed, the death of Secretary Colin Powell was, was posted many times by multiple sources, giving him a choice of which one to read, whereas the algorithmic version chose one to give him for him. 
Another thing about the chronological view was he didn't see sponsored or recommended posts artificially inserted. And in the end, here's, how, here's what Barrett concluded after his experiment. The algorithm is there to show you who Facebook thinks you are, but also to hide what Facebook knows it is. A little, empty, sad place <laughs> where a few voices get the most attention no matter what it is they have to say. Ouch. So this is very interesting. Um, you know, for folks, the problem is most people that we know in our lives that should do something like this will never do anything like this because it's already too complicated for them to make the switch, right? Um, well, and it doesn't stick either. You, yeah. you have to do it every time or do that bookmark thing. It's like, it's too it's too complicated for most people. Yeah. So, but you know, I I don't use Facebook enough for me personally. You know, I have my posts that I I like to put up, and uh, and, and uh, unfortunately, with all the bad stuff that goes around Facebook, I tell the story all the time. I was able to find my long lost niece who I hadn't seen in 20 years because of Facebook. I got a message out of the blue. It's like I think you're my uncle. And we just lost contact with her mother wow. for years. And so it kind of always has like a, you know, a little hitch to me. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely recognize the issue in the echo chamber that's created. So being able just to see recent posts, maybe you would lessen the amount of foolishness that you see that are driving such a divide between friends. Now, I'm, I, I want to say I tried this today. Uh -huh. So rarely go into Facebook. And when I do go into Facebook, I'll be honest, it's either the look at the DTNS page or the SMR podcast page. So the <laughs> algorithm showed me three posts related to Chris here about barbecue and tech and the SMR podcast. Uh, and then also gave me a post about Pixel 6, uh, 21 hour old uh, post from a friend whose, whose father had passed away, two day old cartoon from Scott Johnson. The chronological version was two CBS News articles and almost entirely posts from a group I follow called NumTot that I'd forgotten I even followed, but apparently they just post a lot. See, so, who says Facebook doesn't put the important information up there? Yeah, <laughs> it was a good half a dozen posts before I got to Allison's husband posting a birthday wish. I was like, oh, look, somebody I actually know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I made the switch just a second ago just to kind of see, and it was definitely but a bunch of posts uh, from friends. But I, honestly, I think I've trained myself to just ignore stuff that comes in that I would just don't pay attention to. So it, it, I'd have to really pay attention to see if I may, if it makes that much of a difference for me personally. Yeah. It was interesting to me that Barrett noted that he didn't see a lot of posts from his friends, mm. and I also noticed that too. Is that a lack of friends? Uh, yeah, maybe it's just that we both lack friends. That's a, that's a perfectly reasonable explanation. But if, I don't know. Maybe Facebook's a ghost town where brands are just talking to each other. I don't know. Right. Oh, that would be funny. And everybody's <laughs> just using it for marketplace and birthday reminders, like Stoic Squirrel says he does. So, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That was BioCow who said that, but still, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, let us know. If you try this experiment, what you find out, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Now, listen. We know you are listening to the ad-free feed on uh, Patreon, but not everybody is. So here's what we want you to do. Remind the folks, if you hear them listening to the public feed, that they can get a personal RSS feed supported directly by them at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Back in April, Apple rolled out a change to iOS that requires apps to get user consent before sharing data about them with third parties. Those third parties usually would be ad services that can use that data to better target advertisements, not only on iOS, but other platforms as well. The Wall Street Journal has an overview of how Apple's privacy policy on ad tracking is affecting businesses since it rolled out. App analytics tracker Flurry, for instance, estimates U.S. users opt into tracking because you have to pick. It gives you a, a pop-up. U.S. users will say, yeah, go ahead and track me 16% of the time when they encounter that prompt. You think that's high or low? Uh, I think that's probably spot on. Actually. I think it's, I think it was, I, I think I would have guessed 20, so it's not too far off. Yeah. 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 Uh, one of the effects is that without the Apple's user data, there are fewer users that can be precisely targeted. 
Think about it. If Apple users, you know, most of them are saying, nope, don't track me anymore. Then when you want to say, I want an advertisement targeted to uh, people who game and like drafts, there's fewer of them in that data set now because a bunch of people opted out. That means the cost to deliver ads to those remaining users goes up. That's just simple supply and demand. A company called Get Sticks, which sells pregnancy and fertility tests, uh, told the Wall Street Journal their acquisition costs for, adver for, for users has tripled. They pay three times as uh, much in advertising to get a new user as they used to. So they reacted by shifting their ads off of Facebook and taking them to TikTok and email, as well as trying to tweak their Facebook ads to get a bigger boost from the algorithm. I think the secret is right there. You're going to see a learning curve here. And this is going to start to fix itself a little bit. Now, those are anecdotal examples. Uh, but Snap Inc. said in its earnings report Thursday that it made a billion dollars in revenue, but that was three million shy of what it expected, due in part to a fall in its advertising business. And it attributed that to changes by Apple. It said it expects to have slower growth this next quarter because of those changes. Another effect of this is less accuracy in measuring an ad's effectiveness. Since you can't track an Apple user that has said they don't want to be tracked, when that Apple user goes and buys something on a website, there's no way to know if they saw your ad or not. Because you can't compare the pixels and go, oh, yeah, that's that same person. Right. And uh, finally, another criticism being levied at Apple is that the change benefits Apple's own ad business because Apple sells ads in their app store and they track you through iOS, but Apple points out they ask for your permission when you set up your phone. You may be more likely to give it to Apple, but uh, it's also usually first party tracking, not third party tracking when Apple does it. Yeah. So th this is super interesting um, for a couple of reasons. One, I, I definitely think that Apple could stand to benefit if they make stuff harder, but they should make things harder. And I think a lot of these companies got fat. And uh, a lot of these apps are created simply to gather data about people. And it's one of my pet peeves I used to complain about all the time when people were just trashing Microsoft and giving Google all the props. So everything is free and everything is wonderful. It's like, it's not free for no reason, guys. Come on. Mm. And uh, so I like the fact that at least one platform is taking a, a making a move that requires these guys to put some thought in and actually ask permission before they start taking people's data and making tons and tons of money. I'm not getting a cut. It's one of the reasons I refuse to do self-checkout. I said, until Home Depot or any of these other places pay me, I'm not doing it. So yeah, so I'm not getting any of these ad money. Yeah, and, and honestly, this is not shocking. No. Apple turned off a spigot of data and that spigot of data immediately had an impact on advertisers who were relying on it and advertising platforms who were relying on it. And it's a big spigot. So it's going to have a big effect. And it's going to take a while for everybody to work out the implications of, okay, how do I tweak my copy to get those people who are no longer tracked? How, how do I figure out how to tell, even if I can't tell the individual, like I used to be able to tell that, hey, I ran this ad and I, and I got an uptick over there. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to be done to deal with this. It doesn't mean that Apple is, has irreparably harmed the advertising industry. In fact, it would be shocking if they had made this change and you didn't see these kinds of effects right. in my opinion. So the question is, sh do they have a reason for doing this? And the reason is that people should be in control of their data. And I don't care, you know, how, how you want to argue that this is hurting your, your business as long as Apple is asking every user, including their own, is it okay if we track you or not? And you can say no. That's the right thing to do. And, that is and the right thing to do. The ecosystem has to has to adapt to that. I, I imagine Tim Cook sitting in his office with a big button that, and had a countdown timer <laughs> when he turned it off. And it was like, three, two, one, boom. And everybody <laughs> starts losing <laughs> money left and right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, All right, real great. quickly, uh, Coindesk noticed that uh, Coinstar machines in Walmarts, Coindesk.com noticed that Coinstar machines in Walmarts, uh, the ones that let you dump all your coins in and get cash back, uh, will now let you buy Bitcoin with paper money. So usually you can dump all your pennies in and it'll say, hey, do you want a gift card or do you want uh, actual paper money? You can't get Bitcoin with that. 
but you can go to the same machine, put in some paper bills and get Bitcoin. So it'd be like a two-step process. You pour in all your pennies, get the paper money, and then put the paper money and get Bitcoin, I guess. Of course, you're going to get a transaction fee on both those. Uh, your old pennies cannot be turned into Bitcoin directly, but your dollar bills can up to $2,500 worth. The transaction to Bitcoin is handled by a crypto wallet and payment firm called CoinMe. Uh, so the way it works is Coinstar Machine issues you a paper voucher, probably with a wallet address on it, and then you use that on the CoinMe website to redeem your Bitcoin into a CoinMe wallet. Coinstar will charge a 4% fee for the conversion and a 7% cash exchange fee. So it ain't free to do it. Yeah. But if this shows you anything, it shows you that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is here to stay. Because you can literally walk up to a machine in a Walmart and get uh, Bitcoin. So this is going absolutely nowhere. The other thing the Coindesk article pointed out is that you had that that fake story going around that the Walmart was going to start accepting cryptocurrency recently. Apparently, yeah. because of the fallout of that, where Walmart was so upset about combating that story, they decided not to issue the press release about the real thing happening <laughs> with the Coinstar because they didn't want to cause confusion. So. See, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> they do take Bitcoin at the it's Coinstar. Right there at the machine. Yeah. yeah. No, it's going nowhere. That's a hefty fee, but... You know, if it's it's an easy way to, for people to access this type of money, then yeah, so be it. I don't think it's easy, though. It's easier to just buy it at home on your website, on on a website, isn't it? Than like, going all the way to the Walmart. If you got internet, if you got a computer. If you don't have internet, why are you buying Bitcoin? You it's, have to have internet to go to CoinMe and, and redeem the voucher. Hey, look, Cousin Ray Ray said, this is the new thing, so I'm going to go get me my Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's it. Bunch of people with vouchers piling up. No way to redeem them. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, we got a nice email uh, from Duncan in Warm and Sunny, but wishing it was cold Brisbane, Australia, who said, Hi, Tom, Sarah, Roger, and the entire DTNS crew and family. I've had a long overdue to do in my life, and that's to reach out and thank the DTNS Extended Network. You likely don't remember, but early in COVID, I reached out for assistance in rapidly setting up a video streaming solution so we could communicate with my organization who had been digitally unprepared for not being able to meet in person. Long story short, I was amazed at the support you offered and the lengths the DTNS crew and extended family went to help me out. Thanks in no small part to Roger and others, I was streaming like a pro, and more importantly, you helped get information to people who needed it at a time when this was all so uncertain. From the other side of the globe, you had a positive impact on many others through the generosity of your time, and that's actually pretty cool when you think about it. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. At a time when I was a little overloaded, you took that load and made things easier. My other unfinished business is a long overdue raise. Every day my DTNS family are waiting to inform, enrich, and entertain me, whether that's the latest Google Pixel launch or an in-depth discussion on tacos or hats. I am along for the ride every day. I can't express the increasing value I get from the DTNS network and family, but I can at least increase the value I return as thanks. Thanks so much for all you do. Your newest co-executive producer... I don't think I'll use that title regularly. You should. Duncan. Thank you, Duncan. That's so nice. Oh. Nothing like somebody showing love. You got yeah. to love it. And and that go that that's not just him thanking Roger uh, and and us, but but there were folks in our audience that pitched in and helped out with that as too. So you know anybody that uh, that pitched in with some tips, whether it was in the Twitch chat or the Discord or on email, uh, you know you're part of that thing. So it's it's all of us. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com, folks. Keep it coming. Speaking of which, that community just got a little bit bigger. Uh, thanks to our brand new bosses, Adam Oliver, Annie Martin, and Vivek Bavishi, who just started backing us on Patreon. Oh, yeah. It's always good to get new bosses. Three new ones. Thank you, Adam, Oliver, and Annie. You, if you're not backing us yet, be like them. You'll get a shout out on tomorrow's show. Be like Adam. Be like Oliver. Be like Annie. All right. Be like Len Peralta. Len Peralta's here all the time. <laughs> Writing up stuff. We, I like what you did this week, Len. You oh, got really inspired you. by one of our stories. Yes. So uh, a couple months ago, I got into the NFT market. I don't know if anybody knows that, but I am in the NFT market. I'm on OpenSea. And uh, the story about uh, trying to figure out what the next thing for NFTs is kind of inspired me, right? And I love your idea of, hey, I can do this too, right? I can make this happen. So I've never done this before. I have drawn just an avatar, a drawing of myself, 
and I've made this an NFT. Right now, if you go to OpenSea, if you search me, you'll find this in there. You can't get it on my online store. You can't get it on Patreon. That's the only place you can get it. If this is successful, if people like these uh, DTNets NFTs, I will make one for each member of the community, meaning the people who are contributing to the show. So Chris would get one, obviously Tom, Sarah, Roger, but everybody else. So, uh, you know, see if this will happen, see if this can work and see if this will be interesting. And by the way, they're called, uh, in, in, uh, I decided to call them Len FTs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so check them out. Uh, and uh, go to OpenSea and, and maybe purchase this NFT. Be, maybe this could be your first NFT. Uh, yeah, or if you yeah. go to my online store, you can you can do stuff there too as well. So very cool. And 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 just like uh, we were talking with the bangers earlier, who knows what we'll be able to do with this? Who if, knows? If it gets right. That's what's yeah. interesting about it to yeah. me. All right, Chris Ashley, host of BBQandTech.com. I'm wearing the T-shirt. The T-shirt's amazing. You got to You got to check out the T-shirt. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Yes, these are, these are sweet. How's it going, man? How's it, uh, how are you feeling about that show? Uh, I, you know, I think uh, Rod and I we recorded an episode just this week, and uh, we we really hit a stride on this one. It was talking about tailgating and barbecue, so a lot of information there. So feeling really good of the feedback, the comments I'm getting, and we haven't even put out the the second episode, or the technical second episode yet. It's been fantastic. So really excited about it. I mean, awesome. Folks that want to check it out, go ahead and head over to uh, barbecueandtech.com. Uh, we're doing big things over there, trying to generate this community where we can just talk food and barbecue and the technology around it. And don't forget about your boys, Rob Dunwood and Rod Simmons over at SMR Podcast. We're still doing our thing over there. Good stuff. All right, folks, don't forget, uh, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Allison Sheridan as our guest. We'll be comparing notes on buying our new MacBooks together. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCal, Captain Gifford, Jack Shid, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show included Lamar Wilson, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Chris Ashley. Guests on this week's show included Nika Monford and Terrence Gaines. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>